Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this Norwich Science Festival at Home panel discussion on creative collaborations. We'll just give people a few more seconds to arrive and then we'll get started. Good evening, my name's Rachel and I work in the events team at UEA. Thank you for joining us for this Norwich Science Festival at Home event. I'll shortly introduce our chairperson, Kate Dunton, who will introduce us to the rest of the panel, but first a bit of housekeeping. After they've introduced themselves, our panel will be taking your questions, which you can post in the YouTube live chat. I hope we'll get to as many questions as possible before we finish at 8 p.m. Please remember that all viewers will be able to see any comments you post in the live chat. Once this event has ended, please do tell us what you thought by filling out our survey with the chance of winning a John Lewis voucher. The survey can be accessed via the Norwich Science Festival website or using the link on the slide at the end of this event. To help secure the future of the Norwich Science Festival, please consider making a donation by visiting norwichsciencefestival.co.uk slash donate. Enjoy the event and please do join the discussion. Over to you, Kate. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here and um, would like to very much thank my colleagues at the Norwich Research Park at UEA for inviting me to chair this panel. Um, mm -hmm. Arts and science is a, an area of interest for me, um, having worked previously at the Cultural Institute at King's College London, where I was lucky enough to be involved in supporting a number of arts and science collaborations. And that's very much an interest that I've continued in my new role at the Sainsbury Centre at UEA. Um, so I'm um, very excited to be able to um, introduce you this evening to a range of fantastic panellists uh, made up of three different groups of artists and scientists who've been collaborating together. Um, and between us, we're going to explore um, the nature of this really fascinating artist and science relationship. Um, so the way the um, session is going to work this evening um, is I'm going to start um, by asking our panellists some questions to get the conversation going. Um, that will take us about half of the session. Um, do please um, start posting your questions up as you're listening to the panellists speak, because we are going to give some time over at the end of the session um, to take your questions. Um, so I'd uh, like to start by um, introducing our panellists. Um, our first group um, are made up of uh, Neus Torres Tamarit, who's a multidisciplinary artist working at the intersection between art, research and technology. Um, ben Murray is an artist working in genetics evolution and AI research, researching the discipline of deep learning applied to medicine. And together, Neus and Ben formed Phenotypica, working to remove the boundaries that too often separate science from the rest of human activity and to reveal the creativity and beauty that's revealed by scientific discoveries. And together, um, Ben and Neos have been working with Dr. Simone Imler, um, who is a research scientist at the School of Biological Sciences and a group leader in evolutionary genetics. Working with Phenotypica, her objectives have been to create evocative artworks and immersive experiences about genetics and evolution that engender an emotional response so that audiences react to scientific concepts and practices as a human experience. So interacting with genetics and evolution and being able to perturb the processes um, as they play out allows us to see the processes with our own eyes and therefore form new understanding. Um, our next uh, pair of panelists are Jake um, Monterini um, and Laurie Kerr. 
Jake is a UEA alumnus in the Faculty of Arts and Ham Humanities, and he's a game designer and a lecturer at NUA. He's been working with some uh, PhD students at UEA Science Faculty using game design skills to capture their research into analog games. Um, his work is about communication and designing something creative that allows the reader or player audience to think about something in a different way. Games naturally give players a degree of agency over a topic and can increase engagement in what is usually quite complex narratives of research. So Jake has been collaborating with Laurie Kerr, who's a PhD student at the Tyndall Centre for Change Research at the University of East Anglia. And she's researching new mobility innovations for low carbon alternatives to the use of the private car. Laurie focuses on the adopters of these innovations with the potential for the innovations to be adopted at scale by spreading through processes of social influence. Laurie's research forms part of the ERC ERC funded social influence and disruptive low carbon innovations project. So together they've been exploring how board games can be used to communicate research. And then our final pair, Sarah Phillips, works at the new Quadrum Institute at Norwich Research Park, where hundreds of scientists research the role that microbes, tiny organisms, play in human health. Their state-of-the-art facilities are also exploring the evolution of the COVID-19 virus to understand how it's evolving and spreading. And Sarah coordinates two large human studies looking at the role of microbes and diet in the health of pregnancy and infancy and in the elderly. Sarah has been collaborating with Jenny Pedley, who's an artist and an NHS physiotherapist and has recently been working as artist in residence at the Quadrum Institute. Her artwork explores issues concerning the health of the body and the environment. Her new film, Particulate Matters 2.5, was commissioned by the Peltz Gallery, Birkbeck London University. Made during lockdown, it uses the body as a setting for COVID-like forms, crowned with domestic natural objects, creating an intimate exploration of links between the pandemic and pollution. So I'd like to start um, with Jake and Laurie. Um, and uh, my question for you is, how did you come, start to um, work together? How did that come about? Uh, what drove that initial desire um, to collaborate across arts and science? And um, perhaps tell us a little bit about how you knew each other or how you came to get in touch with each other. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I, <coughs> I've known Laurie for quite a long time. We studied uh, undergrad together at UEA. <coughs> we were living in the same halls in the first year and became friends. So uh, we've been friends for a really long time um, now. And I started uh, this kind of game design quest, if you will, to use the right terminology, uh, on... Um, on my MA at NUA and uh, a couple of years ago and um, really kind of got into one of the projects I ended up kind of getting into this idea of games for education. Now, lots of people kind of discuss that and use that uh, terminology and there's lots written about it at, um, from, yeah, from sort of kids uh, uh, really, but there's a lot that's coming out nowadays about serious games, which is kind of about kind of games that are used for educational purposes within sort of adult communities and, and for, for adults. Um, so I decided to kind of pursue this for myself and, and as part of part of the course and um, wanted to do something about sustainability and ended up kind of coming on this idea of urban sustainable um, urban uh, sustainable development and how that can kind of be how I can use games to kind of capture that narrative um, and Laurie's work and what she's doing we kind of uh, uh, through kind of many conversations I was kind of inspired by that uh, uh, consciously and subconsciously, I guess. And I asked Laurie if she would be a part of this because it's important to be, um, I'm not a scientist and I could do lots of research, but I want to get those narratives from within that community to be able to capture the right experience. If I am trying to educate, educate my audiences, right, and my players. So I asked Laurie if she would be a, a part of this and um, 
she said yes, which was great. And uh, we, she's been consulted. She consulted with me and we developed that game. And then this time last year, um, we presented that game and it was called Ecopolis. Uh, and um, we presented it to audiences at, at the Norwich Science Festival last year. And it was great fun and people really loved it. And I learned a lot as a game designer. And um, But I really kind of was inspired about uh, in about how people kind of engage with it and then kind of learn the things that Laurie kind of consulted with me quite easily and uh, what well, I thought were quite easily uh, through through the game. So it was a great experience. It's a great learning experience. And I think it was a really great pursuit and, and kind of that's kind of led me into what I do now and that kind of fruitfulness within the relationship and uh, then all of the... Um, the relationship that the player has with the game is kind of captures maybe a little bit of our, I like to think kind of romantically a little bit of kind of our friendship and, and all of that. And then you learn within that space. Right. So um, we've been working, Laurie's kind of invited me in kind of into her circles and I've been working with lots of other people, but um, yeah, I don't know if you want to jump in Laurie and talk a little bit about that because yeah, that's where you come in. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks Jake. Um, so yeah, as Jake explained last year, we presented this game that we'd been working on together. Um, and there was a lot of excitement that came from that, from that. And so after that, I put Jake in touch with a couple of guys from my doctoral training partnership um, who organize events and workshops for PhD students, all about the themes of innovation and engagement. And so we thought a project like this would be a really good fit for kind of the, the, the kind of stuff that these people want to put on. Um, and so from this, we all got together, had a lot of conversations, and we organised a series of workshops for PhD students in the Faculty of Science to come along to, and to turn their research into a board game. Um, and at the start of this year, we had two all-day workshops. Our third one got cancelled because of lockdown, but yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll move to a digital format, it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, we had these two all-day workshops, and in these, like Jake explained the process and the steps of like taking your narrative, so the story that you want to get across from your research, and turning it into a into a fun game. And um, it was really interactive, and it was really fun, and there's a lot of bouncing ideas around, like lots of coloured post-its everywhere, like counters and pens and dice. It was great. Um, but as well as the workshops, um, the idea was that we would go away and iterate on these games on our own. Um, and so as an example, I took my game along to the pub with a few people from my research group. Um, and that was a really good experience because we placed tested it together. And it was an important part for me to get the input from people who know my research well and kind of know what story I'm trying to tell with this game. Um, and so, yeah, the plan was to have these games for people to play at the Science Festival this year. Um, but instead, you get Jake and I talking about them. Um, so <laughs> hopefully... At another event at some point in the future, we can actually get the public involved, like hands on with these games, and um, because it is a really engaging way, we think, to, to tell a story about your research. Yeah, Laurie, I'm interested. I think some years ago, this would have been seen as very kind of niche, unusual activity for a science PhD to be involved in. How important is it now for PhD students to already be thinking about public engagement and creative approaches? I think it's really important. I think I'm quite, we're quite lucky as well. Like I'm part of the MVS um, doctoral training partnership and it's, it's quite heavily promoted to be able to think about how you can communicate your research and like get involved in these different projects and these different outreach events. Um, so yeah, I think it is, it is a really important thing to, to be involved in. Um, I had no experience with board games whatsoever. I'm not a person who plays them typically. Um, so it's not like this is something I've had as a hobby on the side. Um, I just thought it'd be fun to do something different. Um, and I think it's also really important to kind of take a step back from your research and think about, okay, like what are the main points here that I want to be able to demonstrate? Because um, I think especially doing a PhD, like you're just so focused on the minutiae of things you kind of lose this whole perspective and essentially it's the big picture is what you bring to a game that you make so I think that's a really worthwhile process as well. Yeah fantastic. Jake did you, did you already have an interest in board games that could educate and do important things for society was that something that had already always motivated your approach? Um, that's a good, good question um, I've I've always played games, uh, a bit of a kind of nerdy confession. And uh, 
I kind of found myself pursuing this route because of like the value in in art I think and and actually kind of my pursuit and my my curiosity and gauge has kind of constantly evolved as kind of I've grown up and and uh, and kind of learned new things and and that's always been there and I think that's that's really that was really something I wanted to pursue. Um, so <clears throat> taking to shifting careers and 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 taking this route, um, I just was expo- I kept myself available to all the different uh, options. And um, I'm a big believer in the idea of um, of how games kind of engage us, right? Like we we all kind of play games, uh, whether we know it or not. I think we it's so in- natural and innate to us that this idea of play and in games is kind of capturing that. But like the the using that and the kind of the without sounding too dramatic like the power of that to be able to tell certain stories that are very important like the research Laurie's doing and and all the people that, that, that kind of pursue this route is it's a great partnership like it's a, it's a fantastic tool to communicate because people feel that they can do something and to make people feel they can do something over a particular science or a research is mm. I think is a really uh, amazing uh, uh, opportunity that like we should like I want to keep doing keep making games and get people to engage in more and more stories yeah fantastic you're not just sitting there passively receiving that information Mm. you're actually an agent in that absolutely that game space that's fantastic thank you so much so moving on to our our next pair of panelists sarah phillips and um jenny pedley um i'm interested to know what does working together across the arts and sciences allow you to achieve and explore that you couldn't achieve if you stayed within the traditional boundaries of your field so what's the driver to sort of go over into the other side um, and explore um, that intersection Um, shall I go first Um, I think um, it's something that I've always done I think it um, maybe because my family studied science and they carried out art activities as as hobbies it seemed normal to me and then in my training I qualify I have a science degree in physiotherapy and then went on to qualify in art so it seems like a normal way for me to explore the world through both routes mm-hmm. and um, so I've done a lot of projects in the past where I've drawn on different disciplines which I've found really really exciting I think some somebody once told me that I get bored very easily <laughs> so I think uh, always to be learning new things is is very exciting especially as in the time at Quadrum I found it was a way where I could tackle um, issues that I was really concerned about big issues about health inequalities Mm -hmm. um, which they are finding out really important information which is changing how we see ourselves in the world now that we're understanding that we're not alone we are um, creatures that are hosts to millions of microbes which we need to feed with a whole variety of vegetables in order to uh, to promote health and it seems to me that this is a um a the way that scientists and artists are both seeking to find out who we are in the world and to picture ourselves and i find it very important to um to look at empowering people who are maybe not accessing the, this, the latest research. And so to be able to go and get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, mm-hmm. um, and feel that you've got the most up-to-date information, but not only that, you can start to examine the processes about how people get to these results and then draw other people in. So it wasn't just I wasn't just moving across science disciplines, but I was also inviting other artists in from different disciplines so that while I was trying to process all these dialogues that I was having, and in some ways I didn't have time at those points to, to get the, um, my creative materials processes to run along fast enough, I was bringing in other people who I've met since moving to Norwich three years ago and thinking, oh, your practice would fit in nicely here and bringing in um, activities for the scientists to try and then moving into um, um, the the Coleman School where they have deaf students and libraries to meet with families and also at Norwich Science Festival. So it felt like a big sort of melting pot for creative activities and Mm -hmm. and science discussions and 
just to mix it all up and see what what comes out. Um, I see there's a question from Rick Hall who's talking about supporting community engagement where confidence in science is low. And that this is one of my main obsessions really. Before COVID, I, I felt like, particularly with the environmental issues that you've been talking about, but also with health, that it's so important that people can own science as well as creative activities and be empowered through, through both of them. Mm -mm -mm. Well, we're certainly living in an age where we can't uh, avoid thinking about science in one form or another. And it, and it just goes to show how important it is that people are able to engage and understand and, and, and that the scientists on the other side are able to communicate. Sarah. Hi, yeah. Um, so I agree totally with Jenny here that um, they're incredibly important relationships um, to build. Um, and I think that both parties are creative, but sort of from my own experience, creative in very different ways. Mm. Um, I'm not like Jenny, unfortunately, with a background in both disciplines. I'm very much science based and have not really that much uh, an artistic streak to me. So mm. um, doing some of the things, just the basic things that Jenny was bringing to us was something like seeing our work in a completely different way, sort of physically seeing it rather than mm. thinking through mentally. Um, but I guess the thing that's really benefited us is in being able to communicate our research. Um, we obviously do communicate our research quite in a variety of ways. So we will um, publish our research, we'll use social media, um, all the visual representations that are, are usual. Um, but the thing that Jenny's brought is sort of in, including the emotion um, of our research which I think is sometimes lacking in mm. publications and, mm. and things that can make it more impactful for people that are looking at it that might not really get the background and why you're doing the research if they can feel mm. what the artist has brought. Mm -hmm. Great thank you. Um, Sarah you know what you talked about that, that idea of emotion and, and people really investing um, and obviously that's that's nice for the individual but why does that matter um well i guess without that emotion people it, it, there won't be action um so mm. a lot of the research that we do it, we're, we're doing it because we want to improve something a system mm. or um gain knowledge in a particular area mm. but if people can't connect with that um then it's it's not going to change sort of if um so for instance um the big wiggly thing behind me is the gut um, mm. and this is an installation where we'd bring kids around it you can walk through it and different lights would come on and it mm. would represent your gut microbiome mm. and showing you sort of if, if you do these certain things this is how it will look um, right. yeah. and that sort of will inspire some emotions for people to go oh well maybe we need to change the way we're behaving um, and so on yeah Fantastic. Thank you very much both. So um, moving on um, to our, our last uh, group of um, panellists for the final question of this first half. Um, so this is to um, Naeus, Ben and Simone. Um, what advice would you give to artists or scientists thinking of working together? Um, what have you learned about what makes a successful arts science collaborative relationship? Because they're two different languages, they're two different worlds. What, what advice would you be handing on from experience? So if I start from my perspective as a scientist, um, I think it is a fantastic way to step outside your comfort zone and start looking at your science from a slightly different angle and try to understand it from a slightly different angle. Um, I think I saw Ben and Neos's work for the first time in when it was, ex, they had an exhibition at the Grant Museum in London and it was just, I just loved how, how their artistic uh, work interacted with the with the biological um, exhibits that they had there and I just I just thought this is this is an absolutely brilliant and very novel you know interaction and you know maybe at first it may seem that science and art have very little to do with each other but I think 
I think both are very creative in very different ways. I agree there with Sarah, but I do think that science needs to be quite creative. So you need to, you know, in order to really make a, a, a step forward in your in your research, I think you need to have the courage to step outside your comfort zone and maybe try things that nobody else has ever tried before. Because if you try the same things as everyone else has tried before, you will not get anywhere with, with, with your questions. And I think the same is true if you know if you start collaborating with artists and I think what was most eye-opening to me was when Ben and Neos came to Norwich to visit our lab and they um that you know they followed us in 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 our everyday steps and they observed us and they asked questions and I suddenly realized it's quite funny how they see things that we see in a certain way in a very different way so they they um, looked at the processes we do and ask questions that really made us think, yeah, yeah, that's actually a really good question. Why do we do it that way? And why don't we do it the other way? So I think mm -mm. have the courage to do it. And, you know, start. I think it's just a great way to change your perspective and, and get some novel insights into what we've been doing for sometimes years even. Mm. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. So oh, um, for for me, the the advice that I would give uh, from my own experience is um, to be open minded. This it can sound a um, very typical thing to say, but sometimes we can forget that as um, we can forget about it. So we may have a very well structured idea of uh, how we want the res this oops, sorry <laughs> the residency to be, or how uh, the project that we want to develop with a scientist. But as soon as the, collaborat the collaborative relationship starts, um, uh, things uh, can change and go into different directions. And sometimes that can be difficult to accept um, for both the artist and the scientist. And, um, you know, um, it can involve a lot of aspects, uh, uncertain aspects. And... Um, you know, sometimes it's good to kind of, we have to keep on doing artistic tests. Scientists need to tweak their scientific experiment to achieve the result that they want to achieve. And hopefully, you know, we will achieve the result, but um, it, yeah, it's kind of like about, about this, keeping an open-minded and embracing all, all these um, aspects. Also, um, you know, uh, science and art are, are quite similar in certain aspects, but also art is quite subjective and science seeks objectivity in, in everything that it does. So sometimes this crossing of boundaries can be a bit um, and difficult, you know, mm. can be a bit difficult and frustrating. Mm. But, um, you know, for example, talking about the collaboration with Simone, um, um, it was quite easy because maybe because uh, she, she once considered a career as an artist and she's uh, quite a lot into art uh, still. So she was totally on board with, with what we were proposing to her and with our interpretations. And also um, with, the, with the whole team as well, the, the kind of our interpretations, artistic interpretations were quite aligned with, with their perception of our artworks. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, just and going back to, to the being open-minded and the last mm -hmm. thing that I want to say, maybe a, a, a way of, of being able to tackle this is, um, focusing in the in the process of the art and science collaboration rather than in the in in wanting to achieve a final product that you know it will happen product art you know artwork a video game uh, installation it will happen but you know being able to to move through this process mm -hmm. and embrace it i think it's the the way to go yeah Great. Yep. thank you a lot of what's been said, uh, I'll just be kind of saying it in different words, to be honest, because I think we're all kind of on the same page amongst all the panelists, really. I mean, I, I think that you, as an artist, you can't just go in and, well, I mean, you can if you want to, if you want to make false colour images of the scientist's research for your, uh, um, your artistic practice, that's great. But 
I think as a, an artist going into a lab, into a science lab, you really do have this duty of disruption. And as a scientist, you kind of have the duty to be disrupted a little bit, not in a negative way. We're not talking about Bunsen burners off desks and things like that, but, you know, making the scientists think about their subject differently, bringing them to your perspective, bringing yourself to their perspective, of course, as well, and trying to see what they see when they're, they're, they're carrying out their science, but really giving them an opportunity to see their subject from 90 degrees. And it, it comes down to this idea that the brain is an associative machine and the more associations you can have for a given fact or set of facts or relationship between one thing or another, the more strongly you can intuit about it. The, the, the connections give you depth of expertise when you're thinking about something. And I mean, I found this in my day job as a deep learning researcher. But, you know, I hate reading papers. I, it's one of those things that I just have to grind through when it's required of me as a scientist. But in playing with some of the things that people have done artistically with neural networks, I gained far more intuition and understanding about how they worked mm. than I did by reading papers. Mm. And so mm -hmm. doing versus, uh, versus just reading, but mm. it's a very strong thing to play with your subject. And having an artist and a scientist come together, it gives them both a chance to play with their respective media. Mm -hmm. I've heard this before, um, Ben, talking to other artist-scientist pairs about this idea of sort of um, constructive disruption. Um, and, and I think there's something lovely you've got at there, which is it isn't just a linear the scientist has done the research now sort of go and color it in as it were um it is actually about bringing together those distinctive ways of looking and thinking um and opening out new ways through that collaboration um and and, and generating new knowledge and new understanding through a through a more reciprocal process so that's fascinating to hear about that thank you so much well, thank you for the, the first half of this um, session. I think that's got us off to a fantastic start. Um, and I'm going to um, hand over now um, to our um, facilitators for the second half of the session, um, who are going to uh, carry on the discussion and start to pull in questions from our audience. Um, so uh, facilitating this part of the session will be Dr. Jenny Rant. Um, who began experimenting with different types of science communication while studying for her PhD at the John Innes Centre in 2005. During her time as a postdoctoral researcher, she was able to combine outreach with her laboratory work. In 2012, after five years of volunteering for the Science Art and Writing Trust, or the SOAR Trust as it's more commonly known, Jenny decided to take on a full-time role as SOAR Programme Manager. Uh, with Jenny will be Professor Anne Osborne, who is a group leader at the John Innes Centre and Director of the Norwich Research Park Industrial Biotechnology Alliance, and founded the Science, Art and Writing SOAR Trust, um, a cross-curricular science education outreach programme. The Trust specialises in supporting scientists in the design and delivery of innovative public engagement projects, working with professional artists and writers. So I'm going to hand over to Jenny and Anne to pick up that angle of um, uh, or continue that discussion of um, the importance of public engagement and working with artists. Thank you very much, Kate. I, I think it's been a really interesting discussion so far and it's great to see you all together. And I have, I have so many questions. I'm sure there are questions coming through. I can't see them yet. Um, it's good to hear that science is creative, or at least good science is creative. And I think that's something that Sarah said. And I wondered whether, perhaps starting with Sarah and Jenny, you might be able to comment on whether you think there are commonalities between the creative process in science and art. I'll come in on that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think there definitely are. Um, I think again, like, like Ben was saying, Previously, I think the, the whole panel is saying that um, I think there's a creative side that is common to both um, science and art. Um, sort of, it's just 
a different way of problem solving essentially um i guess the the difference comes in the the manner that you do that um so for instance i uh, there was a question from the audience about um do you think there's a pre preconception that science is not creative um i wouldn't agree with that i think it would be creative but i wouldn't call myself artistic um i think there's two differences between that um like i think i'm quite operational um whereas an artist i think is the opposite of that i don't know if you if, You'd say that, Jenny, or? Um, I think probably artists are all different. I mean, I know I'm, I would be a rubbish scientist because I'm not very methodical. I tend to shoot around all over the place. You know, my mind is, um, I, I like making connections across a wide field and I'm, I'm not good on systematically doing things, which I see that you guys really have to be but I did find when I was um, kind of bringing in um, creative sort of idea combining activities at the first when we worked together, there was quite a lot of self-consciousness and people were saying, oh, I'm not very creative. And there was quite a lot of anxiety and some feedback was suggesting that the next time I came in, my maybe my activities could be less open ended. And um, so I guess it's just what um the systems that you're used to working with because of course you know you guys are having to come up with creative solutions and asking really interest you know kind of even working out what the questions are that you're asking and imagining how to solve things is entirely creative but it's, it's the art label that can be a little bit intimidating i think yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the thing is starting from scratch and, and trying to identify a problem and then solve it is something that we all do. Um, I've had all these messages saying that I haven't got chat open, but I do have chat open now and I've realised that there are lots of questions coming in. Um, so there's one here uh, from Rick Hall on YouTube. How can the arts support community engagement, especially where confidence in science is low? Well, that's an interesting question. Would anybody like to address that? Is confidence in science low? Do we feel that? I think that, I mean, from our artistic practice, one of the reasons we went into genetics and evolution in the first place is there's a historically fractious relationship between some kind of aspects of popular thinking and genetics. People are still quite reticent with the idea that they might have descended from apes and that are not somehow separate apart from mankind with a unique destiny and being being placed by the universe in on a, a ball around an average sun in an unremarkable uh, galaxy is a challenge for people. And <clears throat> I mean, genetics has that issue with evolution. People, some people are uh, largely because they don't understand it or because they've never understood really a fact of it and how it relates to them. I think one of the things that we really like about making art about genetics and evolution is that you can actually show people things that they're resistant to being told. And showing is so much more compelling than telling. Didn't mean to rhyme that, but uh, never mind. It, it, it's, I think it's still true that essentially when they say an image is worth a thousand words, uh, uh, unwinding evolution in human time is worth many images. And it, it's a really amazing way of gaining intuition and breaking through that barrier that's in the way. So definitely 100% yes. And also art um, um, has an undeductive way or maybe art about science or the art that we intend to do about uh, genetics and evolution. It uh, tries not to be didactic and because it is not shown maybe in a classroom um, setting, you know, that kind of makes people maybe a bit less scared of um, interacting with a scientific concept through an artistic way. So the whole frame of reference changes and um, yeah, that makes science maybe more approachable. What we oh, have with us. Thank you. 
We have another interesting question here from Fred Schwala. There's a lot of data showing that PhD students in science report worryingly, worryingly high levels of mental health issues like depression and anxiety. How can art collaborations help? I think that's a very interesting question. It would be good to know what the data are for students across the different disciplines. You know, is there a difference in happiness and, and um, would collaboration provide more fulfillment? I don't know who's best positioned to comment on that really. Um, I'm a PhD student, so yeah. I might not be able to answer it most distinctly, but I can give it my best shot. Um, I think a lot of the kind of like the mental health ish issues to do with depression and anxiety and why they're so prevalent in PhD students stem from a few, a few key reasons. I think one of them is the imposter syndrome. So it's this idea that you're not good enough, basically, and everyone around you knows so much more than you do, um, and nothing you do will ever be of the standard that people expect of you. Um, I think another key issue that affects PhD students is work-life balance as well. Um, I think it's always easy to look around and see someone who's working a lot harder than you, putting in more hours, and also getting a lot more data a lot quicker. Um, and also kind of like... Think, do you think that's particular to science, or do you think that happens in the arts as well? Um, I, I imagine it would happen everywhere. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's particular to science, but I think maybe there's, I mean, I don't work in a lab myself, so I'm not sure, but I think there might be like a, more of a culture about working in a lab. And so you have to be on site for all these extra hours as well. And I think that can feed into this a little bit um, as well. And um, the expectation that you have to be present to be working. Um, and I think also when you're doing a PhD, it's natural that you're going to deal with setbacks and failures throughout the process. Like nothing ever goes smoothly. And if it does, then great, like have a Nobel Prize. <laughs> I think kind of dealing with these as well um, can all contribute to this uh, crisis, this mental health crisis in PhD students. Um, and I think, as I mentioned before, when I was talking like getting involved in the project that Jake and I was involved in was really helpful just to kind of change your perspective a little bit and so to zoom out from like all the day-to-day -day stuff that you focus on which is so in the scheme of things it's so small in scale uh, like in the scheme of your whole project but to zoom out and to just kind of yeah ask like the basic questions about what I'm trying to do with this project and I think that's really in, uh, important for people to kind of get this perspective um, just one more point really quickly um i think a phd is like a, it's a massive three or four year project with one deadline essentially at the end of it um and so that's like your one output that you get um so i think if you can break it up and get involved in these collaborations and get smaller outputs and like smaller things to focus on on the side as well i think that's really beneficial to kind of put things in perspective but also to give you something tangible that you've done um, and give yourself a bit of a win in that sense i guess so, I mean, it, that's really interesting, but it, it probably isn't just at PhD level. And I wonder whether the other scientists here feel that they've also, mm -hmm. through these interactions, been made to feel more human. You know, you feel that the door's open and there is a world out there. I don't know if anybody would like to comment on that. Simone. Yeah, I can maybe say something. Um, I think what it really helps with this interaction is to 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 generate um, a connection with the with the general public. I think that's what that's what we were seeking with all with all these collaborations as well. So you know, we 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 do work in a lab and we do look at things that can hardly be seen by bare eyes. So when we talk about genetics and evolution, both pro, both are so gen genes, we can't see genes or we can see them on, you know, when once they're expressed on an organism, but we can't really see the gene as such. And we can't really see evolution as such either, because it's a process that usually takes generations. So it's both are very um, somehow elusive and so we can't really see them and I think what happens is when you when you have an art an art an artistic view of this all it kind of bridges the gap between us trying to you know to to explain a concept that is very very um, complex and often a bit difficult to understand and um, 
make just making it easier to easier for the people to 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 understand to see so you know if we if we show a zebra fish and a few eggs and sperm that's that's one thing but if we actually show something artistic and show the whole flow that has led on you know all the processes that go around the the sperm and the eggs i think that's that's where it becomes more human yes i do think so but I, I, does does that make you as an individual as a scientist feel more more connected yes i because i can suddenly start you know people they they lose a bit their shyness um and they start talking about the art and not so much about you know they 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 don't feel so inhibited by not knowing the terminology that comes with with science but they actually start describing what they see and that makes it easier for me to see where they're coming from and then I can, and the conversation just becomes much easier. Yes, I do think so. I, can I just jump in? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I really want to expand on that because I think those are some great points. And I think that from a, an artist point of view, the key thing that you're saying there is about seeing, right? And I think um, we kind of put all of this weight on seeing and um, and that's how we kind of understand our, our world and, and can kind of categorize it. And, and it might make us feel more confident and comfortable and the work that kind of, I like to do and why I like board games so much is because there are so many dimensions to it and feel is a huge part of that right so just from touching the pieces to have the emotions that you feel through the agency that you have in the game in invites feel into that experience as well so that's why I think games and art are really important it is really important because of this idea of this invitation of feeling um, and it's not to sound kind of like <laughs> you know, hippie or, or anything like that, it's, it is really on multiple different levels. And I think that allows us to really feel like the connection and and kind of break down those resistive barriers and feel confident and, and all that good stuff. So we kind of can take it all in, not just through our eyes. So that is important, but with, with kind of feel as well. Yeah. Ben. And yes, so, I mean, just to, to add a, a different aspect to this as well, it's kind of, it's getting to the point now in science that you're almost doing your PhDs a disservice if the program doesn't involve public engagement. Because uh, these days, if you're looking at funding, you're looking at the section of the form that says public engagement. And I'm sure there's lots of quite old school scientists who just dread having to fill that particular section in, but uh, need to do so because public engagement is increasingly seen as a very important part of funding science programs. And I mean, if, for example, at my school, the uh, all the PhDs are required to do at least one piece of public engagement as part of their PhD program. And I think that sort of thing will become quite mainstream because it's such an important skill to have. So we, we have a message here from Ali Fowler, who says, as a creative person who struggles to understand the technicalities of science, how best can I engage with interesting scientific research without getting completely lost in it? Well, one answer is approach the Saw Trust and get involved in that. But uh, any comments? Jenny, do you have anything to say? Yeah, um, yeah, thank you. I was just about to say um, that images actually are a really crucial part of the work that we do um, because we find that scientific images provide a sort of a way into the science. So it doesn't matter if you don't actually know exactly what you're looking at. If you are intrigued by the image, then you start to want to wonder what is it um, and start to read around it. And it's quite addictive actually looking at scientific images. And there's some great image libraries out there where you can just explore um, and just see which ones interest you and sort of go down a rabbit hole in that respect. Um, and also in, um, Sort of creative writing, so in so in science, in science, in science poetry, they're all roots into science where you can then kind of start to build up your knowledge um, to a level that you feel comfortable with. So I think, yeah, there's many ways into um, exploring science without having to get lost in all the, the jargon and uh, have a <laughs> thorough understanding of the topic. Jake. 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 Um, I, I think uh, images is a great answer and I think I really want to sort of piggyback on that and uh, add in play as well like and I know this is very this is kind of what I do so I feel like I'm kind of a bit of a selling it like I'm a salesman but yeah I think being able to play is a really great way in, into it because we all know how to do it um, we all like doing it in whatever format that we do it's all is natural to us so 
if you have a chance to play, and I'm not just saying about playing board games, like, you know, play comes in, in many different, in many different forms. So that is a great way in. And then to kind of maybe flip the question. And, and if you're, so from an artist's point of view, to try and kind of get into kind of the science uh, that might be a bit heavy. Um, uh, my, what I kind of find uh, that I end up doing is just to ask questions, but to ask the questions that are going to um, get to your understanding. So not, so that might be, coming over this kind of idea of not being afraid to ask a silly question, right? Um, and I think I've had to ask lots of questions when I'm working with Laurie and, and, and her stuff and, and stuff and uh, and all of the, the PhD students I've been working with um, uh, for the game design workshops. So, but it is all about questions and then getting the other people to ask you questions. So um, yeah, it's, I think that that is a great way around it too. Sarah. I, yeah, so I, I totally agree with Jake that questions are um, really helpful as well. So if images weren't your your thing, there are lots of interactive sort of exhibitions um, around if you're in Norwich. Um, and obviously the Norwich Science Festival is always a good one. Um, and there, there are things like a pint of science as well, where people from different disciplines will go to pubs and just give a really brief in, in, like talk on what, what they do. But... I guess if you if you wanted a bit more detail, or if you, even if you wanted to just clarify some things, mm -hmm. ask questions. And I think the scientists who go to those kinds of things really want those questions. Yeah, there there are no stupid questions, and we all ask questions. And I ask lots of naive questions, not naive, but just you know, I don't know, so I ask questions. And from the image perspective, please do Google NRP images or the NRP image library because you'll find so many really beautiful, exciting images of science in Norwich there. And there are accessible legends that, that tell you a little bit about what the image is of. Even if you're not interested in the legend, it doesn't matter. You can take it away and create some artwork or write a poem or do something with it. And they're all freely available to use. Just please acknowledge the source, but that's why we created it. It's a great way of showcasing our science. There are also short courses. Um, Quadrum is about to run an online course on the gut microbe, which could improve your science and your health all at once. Um, I think we can get a link out to that. So, Kate. Yeah, I was just going to add to that, that, that when I've worked with cross-disciplinary collaborations before as well, I had a wonderful colleague who used to talk about divisions of labour. Uh, she came from a sort of union family and she said, actually, you know, the artist isn't there to be a scientist and the scientist isn't there to be an artist. Exactly. Um, and actually respecting the divisions of labour is quite an important part of a good collaboration. Yeah. And that's what we find with these science, art and writing projects. When you have scientists, artists and writers working with a teacher mm -hmm. to deliver a project, the standard of the discipline, the disciplines are discrete, the standards are upheld. Mm -hmm. But it's such an exciting interaction and everybody gets involved in the different activities it's just that the scientist leads the science the artist leads the art the poet leads the writing and so on ben but i think it's not to say that you can't benefit as an artist from immersing yourself in the discipline and gaining some insight and understanding into the discipline i mean it's it's it, the it, there's a very big difference between understanding enough to be able to converse about it and understanding enough to actually be producing papers which are at the forefront of research. And obviously no one's suggesting that artists necessarily become researchers unless they really want to do that. But I think that it's a nice, as an artist getting into a, a scientific field, it's also a nice project to gradually bring yourself up to speed to maybe conquer some of those dreaded bits of maths on the paper and, and actually sit with scientists and really try and get an insight into what they mean. And I mean, you should remember as an artist, you've already mastered some technical disciplines which are quite intimidating to other people. Mm. You cannot produce uh, beautiful pastel sketches of hyper-realistic subject matter. That's way beyond my skill set, and I could never imagine being able to do it. But as artists conquer technical skills, they have technical skills and it, they don't need to be afraid that these are just different technical skills. That's right. And, and you may well ask a question that would cause a scientist to think differently and to see things in, in different ways. And 
that's very really important. We have one question here, which is a tour de force question, which is probably a good one as we approach the end of this session from Emily Gilman, who asks, how effectively do you think often very logical science concepts can be represented in the abstract concepts of art? What difficulties does this produce? Simone. I think the abstract world of art actually can help with these because, because you have to simplify um, the you know the aspects that you want to show and i think having having to simplify usually leads to making it easier so so you kind of boil you you bring out the most important aspects through the art and all the rest that may may seem in, important when you're doing your, your everyday science actually falls away and i think that that actually helps rather than hinders so i don't think it's 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 um it's a challenge to the scientists to recognize which ones are the parts that are the ones I want to get across. I think that's one of the main challenges here. So, you know, which parts do we not really need and which parts are absolutely vital to get into the art that we want to show to get across the story as a whole. And we, we realize that that's, that's what I was referring to before as well, that this is what helps us, you know, maybe also recognizing where, what our science is really all about. I think, you know, sometimes we get a bit lost in molecules and, and cells and having to crystallize out what is really the essence of our science to then translate it into, into the art. I think that's exactly what this is all about, really. Clearly, this interface between the disciplines. Jake, carry on. Uh, sorry to just jump in uh, last minute, but um, I, I think um, maybe a way I would like to answer this question is to kind of return to something that I think it was Naeus has said earlier about like the value in it is the relationship of the coll collaboration. So that that is is where you kind of get all the good stuff, right? Like the product that you make at the end of it will will be the product, but it will be kind of um, it will be sort of make uh, or broken based on that relationship. And that is kind of how I would like to answer that question in the sense that um, artists might be coming from uh, 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 understanding the abstract and, and being able to recreate the abstract as kind of Ben was saying as well about the kind of the skills that the artists have. They might come from that point. And then if uh, hypothetically speaking, that scientists come from this kind of, you know, logical land and then they kind of meet in the middle and it's kind of that in that collaboration that is where the important thing is. So it's not really as far to come. And I think that um, it's the communication between the parties that then kind of the art is born from. Um, so if that isn't the, the priority, then you will, you will fight, be faced with challenge and you will kind of, uh, it won't be as easy and maybe as enjoyable. So if the collaboration is the, is the priority, that's when you can really celebrate. And sorry, can I jump in? <laughs> Just to add to, to what Jake was saying is that um, in the end, we are doing art and science or more like an artistic uh, approach to science rather than doing science. So there will be an artistic license that we need to take in order to produce the artwork. We won't be able to represent the logic, the specific concepts. For that, we already have science. So um, it's, it's about being able to kind of find a, a good compromise between the su two subjects where the artists are happy, the scientist is happy, and the artwork in the end is, is working because that, that's actually what is, is in our interest. And it, it's, what's, it's what Simone started off with as well. It, it's basically, there'll be a story that you're trying to tell, and that story will have some mathematical underpinning. It will be some relationship, this non-linear function, which is playing out over time if it's a dynamic system like genetics and evolution. And it's about finding the way to tell a story about it where the boundaries that you break don't invalidate the story. So you can, you can play with any aspect of the story that doesn't break its essence to then take that one bit of the mechanism that you really care about, that you're really passionate about showing to the world and presenting it in a way that it really captures people. I think that was a really important point that um, artists are artists, 
scientists are scientists, we're all human beings, but the, um, the interpretation of science through art is, is different. It's not meant to be a, 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 an explicit representation of the science, it's an artistic representation. And that's the really exciting thing, I think, about this kind of interface and the journey and, and working together. And I think everybody feels richer for doing it and hopefully the fruits of that can then resonate out into the wider community and help to make science a meeting place for everybody. So I, I realize that we've now approached eight o'clock. I don't know if my co-chair has any learned words to say. I like to put her on the spot. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay. So um, I guess I'd just like to say that, you know, I have one of the best jobs because I get to work with scientists, artists and writers all the time who are meeting each other for the first time and hearing about each other's work for the first time. And it's really exciting to just kind of plunge into somebody else's world, into their research and just kind of look at it from your perspective and then sort of share your thoughts and, and come up with something completely new. Um, so I think I'd just encourage everyone to, to get involved in sort of cross-disciplinary collaborations in whatever, whatever background um, is your, your field. Um, yeah, it's, it's really fun. <laughs> right, so um, what happens next is this I mean, we can carry on talking all night. <laughs> yeah. Shall, shall I just round up, uh, Anne, and just just by thanking everybody, actually, for participating tonight. I'm particularly grateful to our friends at Norwich Science Festival for giving this, this opportunity. We're very proud at UEA of our creativity. It's a big theme for us. And so it's wonderful for us to be able to share that. And, and the panellists, I think, have done a wonderful job of showing the creativity of scientists, the creativity of artists, and the creativity they generate together when they come um, into these exciting collaborations. Um, I'd like to thank Emma Skeet from um, Biological Environmental Sciences because Emma was fantastic at helping us all coordinate this. As you can see, there's quite a few of us involved. Um, and uh, she herded cats to uh, make this um, panel happen. Um, and finally, to the panelists, thank you so much for all your really thoughtful questions and absolutely fascinating insights. And thank you to those of you who've been watching and sharing your fantastic questions with us. And I don't know, maybe some of us might be able to stay on and carry on answering some of those questions on the on the chat thread. I know that there will be some links posted on um, the projects that our panelists are involved in, um, in the events page um, on the Norwich Science Festival. So if you're interested, and you'd like to find out a little bit more about those, I think there's some links through to some more information there. So thank Thank you, everybody, and, and, and good night. Thank you, Kate. And also uh, thank you, Anne, Jenny, Emma, and all the panellists, just echoing everybody's thanks there. It's been a really engaging discussion. Uh, thank you again to all of our audience for the questions on YouTube chat. Sorry we didn't quite make it to all of them, but um, we'll try and answer as many as we can in the comments on the YouTube video. Um, and yes, thank you for watching. Please do tell us what you thought of the event by completing our survey using the link that you'll be able to see on screen very soon. And please also uh, consider donating to the Norwich Science Festival. Uh, you can do that by visiting norwichsciencefestival.co.uk slash donate. Please do join us for more Norwich Science Festival at home events. All the details are on the Norwich Science Festival website and Facebook event listings. At 7 p.m. tomorrow, we'll be discussing clinical trials with scientists from across the Norwich Research Park. We hope you'll join us. See you then. Good, good night, everybody. Thank you.